Good morning. Thank you, Pastor Gaines, for another opportunity. Uh, I really want to thank you. I know you're going to have some thank yous along the way, but uh, I was talking to some of the other ministers yesterday, and I know there's not a going away anything for you, but you have been a breath of fresh air, and I appreciate what you've done, the communication, um, just, just the, the fellowship that we have. I know that's not part of the sermon, but I just wanted to say thank you. And, uh, reach you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, I recognized my wife earlier. She's in the choir. She's um, coming around. And uh, my friend, Cedric. Stand up and say hi, Cedric. Amen. So Cedric uh, leads a men's group. We meet every Monday night for two hours down in Woodbridge at Panera Bread uh, through uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, a group we have to do. It's called uh, Spiritual Formation. He said he'd come out and support. So thanks, Cedric. Appreciate it. On this Veterans Day, I'd like to thank all the veterans again um, here and online with us this morning. Uh, as Pastor Gaines said, we had a wonderful time. That was probably some of the best food I've had at Antioch <laughs> uh, ever. I can't say in a long time. That was, that was quite the meal. Y'all missed out if you didn't come. Sorry. Um, but thank you all for, for serving your country. Um, and as I shared this morning, everyone got to see that there is a Space Force song along with all the other services, and I sang it loud and proud. Amen. Amen. So with this Veterans Day uh, weekend and the theme being missions for Antioch, um, I'd like to speak on the topic of always on mission. Amen. Always on mission, and like I said this morning, I don't normally do the repeat after me and look at your neighbor thing, but if you would just repeat after me, always, always on, on mission. mission. One more time, always, always on, on mission. mission. Today we're gonna come from Matthew chapter five, verses 13 through 16. We'll start there. Uh, we're gonna jump back a couple of uh, verses to the past, and then we're gonna Bring it back and finish up there. So Matthew 5, 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to God who is in heaven. Amen. Before we dive into this, I want to go back a chapter and look at verse, chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. Now, like I said this morning, this isn't Sunday school. I understand that. It's not Bible study, but there's some good stuff in here. So let's go back to Matthew chapter 4, starting at verse 12. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness, have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region in the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From this time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We go back one more time, and then we'll stay forward the rest of the time, I promise you. Isaiah chapter 9. Verses 1 through 6. But there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. 
But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you at the joy of the harvest, and they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born. For unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We're all familiar with the latter part. We say it at Christmas. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. But I actually want to focus on the beginning of that and, and bring the two up because what's said in Isaiah and what's said in Matthew chapter 4 are exactly the same thing. And what is in common there and what people need to realize is that Naphtali and Zebulun, those territories of Israel were the first that were taken by the Assyrians. They were taken and they were taken into captivity and deported for their disobedience to God and turning away the, to idols and serving other gods, lower G gods. So that's where Israel's downfall started. It's only fitting that Jesus Christ began his preaching at the same location. The, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those guys should have looked at that because they know the history. But not, they didn't know the significance of where Jesus was. Jesus came to earth with a mission. A mission to fulfill. And the first step of his mission is presented in this sermon. The Sermon on the Mount. It starts in chapter 5 and goes all the way to chapter 7, 29. Of course, you know, Jesus didn't have chapters. He just spoke for that whole time. If you have time, I would make time to read the entire Sermon on the Mount. In this sermon, Jesus does a master class in the exposition of the Hebrew law. If you look back in Exodus, I won't go there. I did tell the 8 o'clock service that because we got nothing going on after 10, I can just go all in and just keep talking. <laughs> but I'll still do the short version. All right. So how many days did Moses stay on the mountain to receive the law? 40 days and 40 nights. And the law was given to him. And then Jesus went into the wilderness and fasted. 40 days and 40 nights. And then he exposes and exposits the law. There are no coincidences. I don't look for signs, but in God, there are no coincidences. He knows exactly what he's doing. He knows that Naphtali and Zebulon were the first to fall. He knows that that's where Jesus is going to go and preach the Sermon on the Mount. And so we'll stay right here for a few minutes in Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Again, Jesus came to earth with a mission. At the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus invites his disciples, the crowd that is watching, and all of you who are Christians today to be on that mission with him. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and it gives light 
to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Again, I say and repeat after me, always, always. On, on mission. Jesus is on a mission to bring salvation to the world. And he invites us, you and I, and all who call upon the name of Jesus to be a part of that mission with him. Jesus is not asking you to save anyone. Thank God. Jesus doesn't give you the power to send anyone to hell. Thank God. Jesus in this passage is asking you to do three things. Flavor the world, influence the world, and attract the world to him and for him. And the title of the sermon, Always on Mission, I'd like you to remember that as you go through the week. As you go about your daily lives, think about what mission you are on. Three more words. If you would repeat after me again, then I won't make you do this too much more. <laughs> Flavor, Flavor. Influence, influence, attract. attract. Again, Flavor, Flavor. Influence, influence, attract. attract. While, there are, while you are on mission, there are three ways you can remember your purpose. God wants you to flavor the world. God wants you to influence the world. And God wants you to attract the world to him and for him. Number one, flavor. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is not good for anything except to be thrown un out and trampled under people's feet. Salt has three qualities that I think come out here. Salt adds flavor. Uh, I'll, I'll, I didn't say this to the end earlier this morning, but I'm not advocating for you to put more salt in your food. You know we have a problem with that, so not more salt in your food. But you know the best way to cook a steak? You know, I, I went down and my brother, he, he's, a, he's a great cook, he does everything, but I, I went down and I'm, you know, I'm putting everything on the steak, a little barbecue seasoning, a little this, a little paprika, not paprika, something, something, everything, garlic. And he's like, let me show you how to cook steak. Here's the steak. Here's some salt. Here's some pepper. Cover it up. Leave it alone. <laughs> Don't put any more stuff on it. The salt has all the flavor you need. I like that example because it's time to eat later. Um, but um, what good does salt do in a salt shaker? Can you taste it? What good does salt do in a salt shaker? It's good that we come to church. I highly encourage it. It's good that we go to Sunday school and we go to Bible study. It's good that we can stream church. But God does not want you adding flavor to the pews. God doesn't want you to add flavor to these walls. God has called us to add flavor to the world. We gather here to get recharged. But what are we doing outside these walls? Are you bringing flavor, well, what kind of flavor, but are you bringing God's flavor to the world? Or is the world stripping away your saltiness every day so that you become bland and you fit in? In the past, I had a problem. I was thinking my purpose was to be an Air Force officer and then to one day be president and to do this and to do that. And I happened to be a Christian. At some point, my perspective changed. I'm a Christian, and now I have a job that provides a resource for me to continue to do my work and for living. 
It is a change in perspective. God wants you, God wants me, God wants us to be the salt of the earth and to stay on mission and to always be on mission. So salt adds flavor, but salt also causes thirst. Um, suppose you were in a bar, if, if, if that's what you do. Uh, and I stole this from, from Tony Evans. I won't take credit for this example. I stole it from Dr. Tony Evans. Um, after I use it a couple times, I will no longer give him credit. I will just use it as my own. But suppose you were in a bar and, and they give you water and, and they give you drinks. And, I, and they used to, I think, give you free what? Peanuts and chips because they're salty. And the more salty stuff you eat, the more you want to drink and the more you want to buy. Salt causes thirst. So I'm asking, the parallel to this would be when people look at you, are they thirsty for Jesus? When people look at us, do we cause them to thirst for what we have? Or do they look at us and see us as Christians and say, I don't want none of that. I can do bad all by myself. That's one angry Christian. Again, in addition to flavor and causing thirst, salt is a preservative. Salt draws out water and dehydrates it and prevents bacteria from growing in food. It's a preservative. God wants us to be a preservative. God wants us to be the saltiness that preserves goodness in this evil world. He wants us to add flavor. He wants us to cause thirst. And he wants us to preserve. He wants us to stay on mission. Are we the salt of the earth? Are we flavoring the world for Jesus? My first point was flavor. My second point, and quickly to the end, the next few points are shorter, influence. Influence. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. Jesus calls us to be the light of the world. As Christians, we're supposed to let our light shine. They shouldn't see me as an employee. They should see me as a Christian. I'm not saying we go about beating people about the head and shoulders with the Bible. That'll turn them off in a second. But there should be something about our lives that attracts and influences people. You are priests. We are priests for God in this world. Yesterday, a few of the ministers got together and, and Sister uh, Gaines said that you don't need a seminary degree to be called. And I agree, you don't need a certain degree. You are all called to be priests for God. It doesn't matter your education. It doesn't matter your background. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a priest for God. And you should always be on mission. It's not the pastor's job alone, or the preachers, or the deacons, or the teachers to light a pathway to the Lord. We are all on mission. And we should always be on mission. Jesus says people don't light a lamp and set it under a basket. Just like salt is no good in a salt shaker, your light is no good if it's just in here. We need to take it to the world. Get on mission and stay on mission. I talked about the perspective change I had versus being an officer. At, I just happened to be a Christian. Are you a nurse? who happens to be a Christian, are you a Christian who serves as a nurse? Are you a business person who just happens to be a Christian? Or are you a Christian who has a business and through that business you influence the world? 
Are you a teacher who just happens to be a Christian? And I shared this morning, that's my favorite one. Because as a teacher, you have so many opportunities to influence. I can't do it. I love teachers. I think I shared this morning that they should be the highest paid people in the United States of America. But think about the opportunity and the influence you have on young people's lives. Again, you're not beating them about the head and shoulders, but they want to say, what is it about Mr. Phillips when I'm acting a fool and he's still okay? We have an opportunity. You're Christian first, and that other thing is just something that you do. Stay on mission, always on mission. I talked about flavor, I talked about influence, and in the last few minutes I'll talk about attraction. Verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. People who radiate the light of the Holy Spirit live so that other people see their good deeds and give praise not to me, not to us, but to the Father. All glory goes to God. We radiate the light of Jesus, the light of the Holy Spirit, so that others might see God and come to receive this gift of salvation, forgiveness of sins, eternal life. We Christians exist to reflect God's light in the world. We exist to Why did Jesus save you? Why did he save me? Yes, for salvation. But he said, go therefore into the world, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We are to make disciples not sit in the salt shaker. I know this is not the type of, typical type of missions sermon, but I believe that sometimes when we talk about missions, we get so caught up in going out to other parts of the world Amen. that we forget that we have unsaved people in our own homes, yes. on our jobs, yes. in our families. Yes and in this community. It's a wonderful thing to go out into the world. But sometimes I think God wants you to just be salty right here. Amen. Amen. God called us to flavor the world, influence the world, and attract the world. And to what? Always be on mission. Or always on mission. Sorry, three words. Let's try that again. Always on mission. Will you stand with me, please? Amen.